So um, what I want to present today is how we can interpret um, the Newtonian gravity, the classical theory of gravity, as a curvature of space-time. And to see this, we will uh, I will give a very straightforward motivation and very clear picture why this is needed and why Newton's axioms can't be totally um, interpreted as such if we take them literally. So let's start with uh, the first axiom, which says that a body on which no force acts moves uniformly along a straight line. And this seems to be a very, um, very uh, straightforward axiom. However, uh, it's not as uh, like it's not as uh, easy as one thinks, because a straight line uh, is defined by a geometry, and in mathematics, of course, you can postulate whatever geometry you like for the space or for the space time you have. But in physics, you always get what the straight lines are by measurements, right? So, for instance, if you want to measure distances, you really need to have something which, um, which can be used universally, like everywhere. And if you would try to use a ruler, it would not work in like it would work, of course, in like um, some labs or some specific um, some specific uh, areas or for, for for some lengths. But if you want to go, for instance, and measure uh, distances in the universe or near stars or something, this ruler would not work anymore. And then you need something uh, which works universally, and that will be the light. But this also is motivated by Newton's axioms. Uh, if we check the second axiom, because it really is uh, very strange how the second axiom would imply the first one in the case that we have no force, right? Then this would say that A equals zero, and then it, it would show that it moves uniformly along a straight line. Uh, but that's not the case. And the case is that the first axiom should be interpreted as a measurement prescription for the geometry of space. So that actually, or space-time rather. So this axiom really tells us uh, what the straight lines are in our universe or in our model rather. And there's also another very interesting thing which why the first axiom cannot be interpreted as such. Because if you have a universe with already two point masses, which have, like, we ha which have mass, they're not massless, and gravity would immediately act and you could not ever use the first axiom to determine what the straight lines in your uni universe were. So this is also something very interesting and already gives a hint why um, gravity should be interpreted as a curvature of space-time. And of course, this will the final uh, joy will be that uh, general relativity uh, exactly does this. But what we're going to do today is a precursor to general relativity. So we're going to give motivation and similarities between classical mechanics and general relativity and see how uh, classical mechanics can naturally lead to general relativity. So I would like also to discuss the similarity between gravitational force and the electromagnetic force in the framework of classical physics. Um, we, we can see from equations one and two that both of them are proportional to one over r squared. And um, this is something uh, which um, seems rather um, interesting. And we also know from the classical mechanics part that uh, a force can oh, uh, most of the times or almost always be written as minus the gradient of a potential. And this potential, which actually we will use for the gravitational force, will be the gravitational potential. And uh, because the the like the, apart from the factors of uh, g m1 m2 and k q1 q2 the forces have the same nature or like they behave the same uh, with respect to r we can already state that uh, our gravitational force uh, will satisfy poisson's equation which is uh, which is this one I would also like to note that this, uh, in my convention, the Greek indices run from 0 to 3, and the Latin indices run from 1 to 3. So this is a vectorial equation. 
And then Newton's, uh, here's a mistake, it should be second law, I'm sorry, can be written uh, for the gravitational force as it follows, right? If we interpret the gravity as a force, but we have already seen, and I gave you motivation on this slide, why gravity cannot be interpreted as a force, not even in Newtonian theory. And then in the fourth equation, uh, if we accept the weak equivalence principle, which has been tested by experiments up to maybe 10 decimals, maybe even more, I'm not sure, uh, then we can cancel the two masses appearing in the equation and we can rewrite it uh, as the form of equation five. And after all this motivation, which we have seen that gravity should not be interpreted as a force, rather something else, we will slowly go and start developing what this something else should be in a rigorous manner. Uh, in order to do this, we will need some differential geometry. So let's start with them. I'm not going to define uh, properly what a uh, differentiable manifold is. However, if you are interested, we can discuss this uh, after the seminar. But for now, I would like you guys to think about differentiable manifolds at spaces which you look uh, locally like R to the N. You can also like, like a sphere, a torus. Uh, you can also think of a cylinder like a differentiable manifold and so on. And the main idea be between um, introducing differentiable manifolds is that uh, you, we want to make physics coordinate free. And what do we really mean by coordinate free is that we want to make physics independent of reference frame. Uh, this picture illustrates this because if we imagine that the real world is a differentiable manifold, or oh, well, the space time is a differentiable manifold, uh, we can we always choose charts or coordinates in order to describe um, the laws of physics. So when you write down Newton's equations, like uh, we wrote down uh, wrote them down here, you have this x i, and they they are called the coordinate functions. So these coordinate functions are always given in a chart, or rather, uh, yeah. So you map them into a subspace of R d. But you could map them into another subspace of R d. You can think of this very easily as uh, solving, I don't know, maybe the Poisson equation specifically. Uh, sometimes you solve it in uh, uh, spherical coordinates. Sometimes you solve it in Euclidean coordinates or Cartesian coordinates. It really depends on the problem, right? In some cases, one problem might be easier to solve in a specific coordinate system than the other. So that's the motivation between introducing uh, differential manifold. And this, uh, and this also um, uh, illustrates the same idea. Uh, and this Tij and Tji are called the chart transition maps. Um, they are basically coordinate transformations, and we want to allow. Uh, all the coordinate transformations possible for uh, because physics would be the same in each reference frame. This is already something which is very similar to the general relativity point of view. But uh, we will see that we can develop this in a very precise manner and get uh, rows of uh, equations of motion, uh, which are exactly Newton's equations from a geometric perspective. That's what uh, we're going to develop. The next uh, step, in order to do this, we need to define, uh, for instance, uh, velocity in physics. So we need to define uh, not only velocity, but um, usually tangent spaces. And velocity will be defined as a linear map which takes you from the smooth functions on the manifold into the real numbers. And these velocities are basically elements, as you can see on this picture, of the so-called tangent space. And on the, the tangent space is simply the space of all smooth curves to a point. And you, on every point of the manifold, you can construct this space, and it will be a vector space. This can be proven. If someone's interested, we can do the proof when the seminar ends. It's a little bit technical. Maybe it would take 15 minutes. But the main idea is that this, uh, this tangent space can be made into a vector space. And as we know, every vector space has a basis. Therefore, we can expand arbitrary vector, and these vectors in the tangent, living in the tangent space will be the velocity vectors. And we can um, expand every, um, every vector into a basis. 
and usually we uh, do uh, choose the coordinate induced basis in which uh, everything looks easier but you could choose any other basis so yeah and the next step uh, in constructing our theory of Newtonian uh, gravity is to be able to add factors. Of course, in uh, flat spaces like the Euclidean space, it is very trivial to, um, to actually add vectors because you can just transport, uh, you, you can parallelly transport uh, from one point to the other without any issue, right? You can very simply think of this when you add two vectors, like um, when you add two vectors, you always parallel transport to get into the same point. This is exactly the reason why we want to introduce covariant derivatives, because in curved spaces, uh, this will not be a trivial fact, and we will actually need a condition to be able to parallel transport curves. And that structure, which actually gives you this, uh, uh, this opportunity, is the covariant derivative. And now I would like to introduce what the covariant derivative really is in a precise manner. So um, we have a smooth manifold. That's a set with a topology and an atlas. And the covariant derivative is simply a map that takes a vector field and a tensor field and sends them into a same type tensor field. And it satisfies four rules. The, four, the first rule is that it acts on functions uh, like the vector field acts on a function. The second rule is multilinearity. Multilinearity in the upper slot, right? The third rule is the Leibniz rule, as uh, you can, you, it's very similar to what we've done in calculus. So the product rule, right? So if you use uh, f times g derivative, if f derivative times g plus uh, g derivative times f, right? Uh, plus f derivative, yeah, f derivative times g plus g derivative times f. And the fourth one is uh, the C infinity uh, linearity in the lower slot. That means if we multiply the vector fields by a function, we can simply pull the function out, right? So this is the covariant derivative, uh, which uh, we will need. And this covariant derivative will make a notion, will make a sense of parallel transport, which I'm gonna show in the next, uh, next uh, slide. And however, I would like to um, like to draw the attention that this covariant derivative will not be unique. And there's additional structure we need to fix it. They will be the so-called Christoffel symbols. And the Christoffel symbols of uh, Newtonian gravity is exactly what we are going to search. So this is a very important remark that the whole idea between uh, trying to interpret the Newtonian theory as uh, in a, from a geometric perspective, will be to compute the Christoffel symbols of uh, the theory. And this is what we're going to do. So this, this I really want to remember. I uh, really want you guys to remember this slide because this will give motivation to everything which will come after. And uh, to actually show what Christoffel symbols are, I want to show you a very simple computation using just the axioms one to four from this slide. So let's look at the covariant derivative of a vector field. We know that vector fields can be expanded in a basis. We have seen this in the tangent space construction. Therefore, we expand this in a basis. Both vector fields can be expanded in a basis, this is the coordinate. These are the coordinates of the x vector field, and these are the coordinates of the y vector. In the following, we will simply uh, just pull out the first um, xi. We can do this because uh, the covariant derivative is C infinity multilinear, and we know that the coordinates are just functions, so we can pull them out. This is the first step we do here. What we are left with is just the basis vector field acting on a product. And on this product, as we have seen before, we have to act with the Leibniz rule or the so-called product rule from, uh, from calculus. So firstly, we take the derivative of the first and then let the second uh, free. That's the y, m is the first. So here, that's what we do. And in the second, uh, uh, second time, we have to leave y, m out. So we take it out, x, i, y, m, and we take the covariant derivative of the del by del xm, which is also a vector field. Now comes a very interesting part. Uh, here we know that a vector field, if it's on functions, it's simply the action of the vector field on the functions, right? That's the uh, 
uh, second, that's the first axiom of the covariant derivative. Therefore, we can uh, conclude uh, this, this uh, line here. And the second term will, in the second term, we'll once again use the definition of a covariant derivative, namely, uh, we know that the covariant derivative maps a vector field and a tensor field into a tensor field. However, this is a vector field which is a particular tensor field. Therefore, the covariant derivative will eat these two entries, which are two vector fields, and spit out a vector field. Now, but now that's the most important part, which I want you guys to um, see, that if it maps two vector fields into a vector field, then the vector field, by definition, can be expanded in a basis. And this basis will be the del by del xq. And this uh, gamma qmi, the so-called Christoffel symbols, are nothing more than just expansion coefficients. They're expansion coefficients. Even though they have indices, they are not tensors, and this can be proven. They are just some functions on the manifold, uh, which help you to express uh, the covariant derivative of a vector. And it's a very nice question, rather, wh whether one can actually fix the structure of the covariant derivative. Like, if we postulate this, or we, we, like, we give the Christoffel symbols, then uh, the very, it's a very good question to ask whether, do we already know the Christoffel symbols, how to act on a covariant derivative? That's a theorem which can be proven. And uh, equation 7 summarizes how the covariant derivative acts on vector fields, respectively covector fields. So don't forget the motivation why we introduced at all uh, the covariant derivative, and that motivation was in order to be able to talk about parallel transport. And this parallel transport uh, will help us to uh, add vectors at different points. And then, uh, as we can see on the picture, uh, this is how we parallelly transport vectors. However, we'll now give a precise definition of what it means to be parallelly transported. So we have a vector field on the manifold, and this is said to be parallelly transported along a smooth curve if the covariant derivative along the tangent vector of the curve uh, of, the, of this uh, vector field is zero. So this V gamma is the tangent vector field, rather, tangent vector field uh, to the curve, All right? And then uh, we have the ultra parallel transported curves. This, this is very simple. It's just uh, instead of x, you take the vector field, uh, like which is um, which is um, tangent to the curve itself. So you you take the um, you uh, transport parallelly a curve along itself, uh, along its tangent vector. This can be proven if you guys are interested. We can do it after the seminar that. Uh, this uh, equation, uh, coordinate free equation, written in coordinates, so if you choose a char, can be written as the right hand side. And this might seem familiar to some of you. However, if not, that's not a problem. This seems to be, it very seems to be the geodesic equation. However, this is the auto parallel equation. And now I want to stress a very important point. This really does become the geodesic equation, and that's how you're going to create uh, the similarity between the Christoffel symbols and the metric of your spacetime. Because if you remember, in general relativity, the Christoffel symbols are always uh, defined with the help of the metrics. So they are like one half partial derivative g something minus partial derivative g something plus partial derivative g something with right indices, right? So. Uh, why the Christoffel symbols look like uh, look like that in GR, it comes from the very physical fact that you want your shortest curves to be also auto parallel, and that's how you you can read off the Christoffel symbols. This is also a very nice calculation to do. And then we finally have all the tools to grasp what a Newtonian spacetime is. In the end, I will give a very axiomatic description and a very nice geometric picture. But for right now, let's just uh, try to interpret Newton's equations, which were f equals ma or f equals mx double dot from a geometric perspective. And this is going to be a very intuitive picture. 
And then I want to say that uniform and straight motion in space is simply a straight motion in space time. So Newton's equation will be basically uh, will give us the outer parallels in this uh, in this uh, geometry. That's that's what it's going to give. And then let's see what a space time really is, right? So we have a particle trajectory in space, which is a map from R to R3, and then we can construct the whirl line of the particle uh, as a, a large x, which takes us from R to R4. And what we do is basically we just um, map uh, map this one. Uh, we just introduce an extra parameter, which is time. And of course, one could ask in a fine geometry, why do we parameterize with, uh, with all the curves and all the coordinates with respect to time? Of course, I'm not saying you, you want to do that. Uh, I mean, I'm not saying you, you, can, you have to do that. You can do any fine parameterization you like, but it is very convenient to parameterize your curves and your coordinates and everything with respect to time, because time is the zero coordinate as you introduce it. So we can see the parameterization here. And now we assume that this um, trajectory satisfies Newton's laws. So because uh, of the weak uh, equivalence principle as stated before, we can omit the mass on both sides. And then this is, uh, it looks like this equation. And I want to stress once again, I really want to stress that this Fi is not arbitrary. This Fi satisfies Poisson's equation. And now about this Fi, I'm only interpreting as gravity, okay? So this Fi is not an electric force, not magnetic force, nothing else. It is just the gravitational force. And it obeys the Poisson law. And now we will see why this uh, x0 equals t is something very, very strong uh, on uh, our space time. What, why, what, what does this give rise to? We can see that if we parameterize our curves with respect to time, and we say that the zero coordinate is the time, then the derivative with respect to time of time is one, right? And the second derivative is zero because this is a constant. And now comes the very, very big trick which we're going to use. So this is, uh, this is a crucial uh, fact that we parameterize by time. However, we could use another fine parameterization. We can go into details later if you're interested. But what I want to stress is that this, this condition, what we see here, is crucial. And it will be crucial because you will see on the next slide how we can interpret this new law as an auto-parallel equation making use of the fact that x0 dot is equal to 1. So this is the whole motivation behind introducing the zero coordinate as the time and parameterizing all our curves with respect to time. Now we have the Newton's equations, right? As I said, they are vectorial equations, so um, they, um, they they hold. And as we have seen before, x0 double dot is zero. And xi double dot minus fi uh, of x of t is equal to zero. This, is, this seems to be very trivial, right? This, this seems to be very trivial, and this seems to be just the extension of the Newton law where we had, instead of um, the particle's trajectory, we have the word line of the particle, right? However, here we can insert an x0 dot x0 dot because this is one from the la last slide. This is what I wanted to stress. We can see that this is one. Therefore, we can insert it without any, any problem. Now, if we insert this, uh, we can really interpret this specific equation, this pair of equations, as an auto parallel equation. So what we want to do is to just simply force upon these equations. We have a system of differential equations, and we force upon them to be the equation of an outer parallel. And so the outer parallel equation, as we have seen before, takes this form. Now the real question, which which uh, which is going to be is what are these Christoffel symbols for this, uh, for, this, um, for this equation? And we can read them down very easily. So check, if, if we have above zero, then, uh, then x double dot is zero. Therefore, all of these have to be zero. That's straightforward, right? So if we have zero up, alpha is zero. We know x double dot equals zero. This term has to be zero for arbitrary x dot and x dot nu. And then the Christoffel symbols have to vanish. 
Okay. Um, if we have, um, uh, we can also see from this equation, from sorry, from this equation, that um, all all these Christoffel symbols, which we have a zero uh, above and uh, below, and BCs have to vanish. Uh, I have the computations done in detail. If you guys are interested, how to actually get these Christoffel symbols, have it in the appendix later on. But the most crucial fact, which I want to stress, is that uh, these Christoffels will just vanish, and the zero zeros Christoffel, not a coincidence, because we introduced x zero dot x zero dot. So it's not a coincidence that just the zero zero component is not vanishing, and it's exactly given by um, this minus f a. And I want to also stress that this minus f a has to satisfy the Poisson equation as it was before. So this was the construction which we wanted to do, and we managed to do it. So we can really interpret, we can really interpret the Newtonian gravity as a curvature of space-time. And the curvature is exactly, well, we'll compute it later, but it's exactly given by, or can be computed by these Christoffel symbols, uh, which can be exactly computed by forcing upon the Newton's law of motion to be an outer parallel, where we can read down the Christoffel symbols. So this, this line is the most crucial part of all the presentation. And of course, now if we have the, the uh, Christoffel symbol, we can just compute the curvature tensor, uh, which is the well, the curvature is, of course, characterized by the Riemann and the Ricci tensors. And the Ricci tensor is just simply the contraction of the Riemann tensor, right? We know all of this, but I have an appendix also computing this explicitly if you guys are interested. However, uh, what I want to uh, want to my whole message of this talk is to see behind all the technical details, of course, with the axioms and definitions and whatnot, that this equation is basically Newton's equation for a very well chosen uh, set of gammas, which are the Christoffel symbols, right? So this is uh, the whole point of my talk. And I will also give once again a motivation. Why is this important? So if we have this and we can interpret gravity as just simply giving us the straight lines in space time, then we can immediately speak about many particles with masses in the universe because there would be no gravity acting upon one another because gravity would not be a force which would act on the first particle or on the second particle or, or on any other particle. Gravity would just simply give the geometry of space time. Even in the classical sense, that's what I want to stress. It's not general relativity which forces us to do this because if gravity really was a force, then we could not have meaningful first axiom of Newton with uh, massive particles in the universe or at least with more than one massive particle in the universe, which is a very strong statement. And then uh, by computing the Ricci tensor, which of course might be a bit tedious, but it's, uh, it's a straightforward computation, which I will have or present, or present later on if you guys are interested, we will get that minus del i, uh, this, is, this is the um, um, curvature tensor. And then, yeah. Seen, this is the whole conclusion of the talk that we can interpret uh, gravity as a curvature of space time, of the Newtonian space time, which can be formulated in a very precise manner. Uh, this is going to be the talk of uh, Gold of the next, next talks. But this is exactly the curvature which you feel if you interpret gravity as uh, a curvature of space time rather than a force. And this Fi is the gravitational potential. Once again, this is the gravitational potential. Okay. Uh, sorry, the well, the so-called uh, what you obtain from the gravitational potential, right? Okay. So um, now I will give a very uh, short introduction and in intu in intuitive introduction into general relativity. Rather, this will not be nor very uh, rigorous nor uh, totally true. And I will, this will be a rather historic point of view, okay? So we have seen that um, in before we have derived that the zero, zero component of the Ricci tensor is uh, given by equation 15. All the other components do vanish, right? And 
we also know that this uh, fi satisfies the Poisson equation. Therefore, from equation 15 and 16, we can immediately read off that uh, the Ricci curvature uh, is 4 pi g times rho, where this rho is the uh, energy density or mass density. And now if we introduce the energy momentum tensor, which is rho divided by 2, then we can see that this is something very, very similar to the Einstein equations. So actually, I, want, I even want to say that if you guys are really interested in history of physics, you can look up that in the first paper Einstein published, and he tried to explain general relativity or had a guess on general relativity, the first, the first trial was strongly related to equation 18. He tried to generalize this Newtonian gravity into a real relativistic gravity by just taking, by just uh, assuming that the other uh, curvatures would not vanish. And he just wrote instead of the zero zero component, he wrote a mu nu. And he said that this would hold for mu nu going from zero to three. And the really interesting thing is that he was not that far from being right. He was very close, but the trick is that uh, one can show that um, the um, covariant derivative of, well, uh, t mu nu can uh, vanishes. That means that t mu nu is covariantly conserved. That's a physical thing we want to do, right? And however, unfortunately, the left-hand side will not be. So the covariant derivative of the Ricci tensor does not vanish. And therefore, you need to add another term and construct the Einstein tensor, which is divergence-free. But this was firstly done by Hilbert. So yeah. And then, yeah, here is the outlook of, uh, uh, of the, well, here is the root of the issue, which I wanted to stress. Uh, is that the energy momentum tensor is covariantly conserved while uh, the Ricci tensor is not. And therefore, we need to add another term. This another term will be g mu nu times r, right? Uh, yeah, one half and g mu nu times r. And then, then where r is the Ricci scalar. And this would solve the, uh, the issue and it would immediately lead to general relativity. So the intuitive picture which we have developed from classical mechanics uh, leads in almost a straightforward way into general relativity. So this is the whole message of my talk, which uh, says that you do not need to look um, very differently to from general from like Newtonian Newtonian mechanics and general relativity are uh, strongly correlated, and this can be seen from uh, these equations twelve and thirteen, which. We think the Newton law as an outer parallel equation. And yeah, uh, the outlook is that uh, one can formulate this uh, with the help of differential geometry in a very axiomatic way and a very rigorous way. And uh, yeah, this will be the topic of my next two talks on this. I would really like to develop a very strong. Um, axiomatic point of view of all this newton cartan gravity, but this might be very technical. So I will do this next week and I will write the prerequisites needed for it. And thank you very much for your attention. If you have any questions, feel free to ask. All right, thank you so much for that. Um, yeah, people can like start unmuting themselves and ask questions now, so yeah. I guess everything was really clear. There's no questions, apparently. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe too technical. I don't no, know. I was actually I've written a little message in in um, in the seminars channel that I, I like the way you approach the Christopher symbols because that was one of the concepts that I always like really struggled with in GR, and you explained it like super neatly. So that was super nice. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, you explained Christoffel symbols really well, and that motivation for parallel transport. You you gave some pretty clear intuition for it. Pretty cool talk. Yeah, and the, the interesting thing is that um, I did not show it in this uh, like in this uh, in this talk, but the really interesting fact is that this this well this can be derived pretty easily. But the very interesting fact is that if one uh, computes the geodesic equation explicitly, like how it's being done in like GR or special relativity books, and you force upon uh, um, the geodesic equation to be equivalent to the outer parallel equation, 
you can really like meme support you can really derive that this Christoffel is the one oh, yeah. which you always have in GR. And this is a very strong uh, condition. Nice. Yeah, like eighty percent of the time when calculating G like Christoffel symbols, the best way to go is just to just to use the Euler Lagrange equations on the geodesic. Yes, uh, yes exactly, the, exactly. Geodesic distance. Rather than actually having to like go through the that the big ass formula. <laughs> exactly. And the nice thing about this is that this approach would work also also in not necessarily um, just um, the classical GR. So you can derive Christoffel symbols also for more interesting theories like GR with torsion if you do this approach. So this is a very strong approach and this is in the foundations why Christoffel symbols look like that. So yeah, this is very interesting. Yeah, definitely seems very interesting because because from because like from the way you presented it, it seems like that any Newtonian theory which satisfies the equivalence principle can can be cast in a way such that it's like it uh, it can be expressed as a curvature of space time. Exactly, that that's the claim. That's the claim, and that 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 can be done totally coordinate free is the more more beautiful part of it, but that's very technical. <laughs> yeah. Oh yeah, yeah. Co coordinate man, the French. The the fact that GR is coordinate free it just makes it it makes it a really nice theory honestly. Yeah. And by the way, related to this derivation of the Christoffel symbols, I would also like to uh, to show you something which is usually also not done in GR books. Uh, why the Riemann tensor components look like that, and you will see that it's also very natural. Um, let's see. So, firstly, if we define the Riemann tensor as in equation twenty three. Uh, and I will give also motivation why this is an intuitive definition. So if you look at this uh, definition, you can see that um, the Riemann tensor tells you nothing more than how the covariant derivatives fail to commute. So if if they would commute, if del x uh, del y minus del y del x would be zero, then uh, then the Riemann tensor would be zero. We will see that this is this term will always be zero. Uh, as long as you do not use spinners in general relativity. <laughs> but uh, but we will not do that. Uh, we will not use spinners, for sure. <laughs> we will we'll use uh, coordinate in this case. Spinners are the most confusing thing in physics by far, <laughs> honestly. What? Spinners are just, spinners are the thing that took me the longest time to wrap yeah. my head around, at least. Yeah, they're totally like just, yeah. Yeah, they're, they're very abstract. Now, if we take this definition and uh, plug in uh, some coordinates, these are coordinates and the coordinate induced basis on the vector field, then we just plug in into this definition, right? So the by definition of a tensor uh, tensor components, they um, they are given by you plug in the coordinate free description of the tensor the basis vectors. And now, if you if we use um, the formula which was given there, uh, we just expand uh, here. We just put instead of x uh, its expansion instead of y its expansion, and then if we have the z, the z is expanded as well. We um, take the same for this term and uh, similar to this term. However, this term will immediately vanish because these are just the so-called partial derivatives and we all know that uh, partial derivatives uh, or we got the Schwarz rule they commute right so the second derivatives they commute so this will be zero last term dies and yeah so now we are left with the expression uh, in this first two uh, first two entries right so this is uh, on equation 30 we can see just uh, the first two entries of equation 29, because this vanished. Yeah, now let's think about, yes? Oh, no, I was, I was just, no, never mind. And now from this equation 30, uh, we can uh, conclude, or we can actually rather uh, not conclude, but we can see that this is exactly the expression this this is exactly the expression which we had when we defined Christoffel symbols. Remember, yeah. watch. It's exactly the expression which we had uh, to define Christoffel symbols. So we can once again use this trick. We can once again use this trick here and here. Mm -hmm. 
So that's how the Christoffel symbols were defined. And then you just expanded the basis, right? You expanded the basis of xp, and these are just expansion coefficients. Nothing special happened here. And now comes the interesting fact that we have to apply the coherent derivative to all this thing. And then we have to use the Leibniz rule, of course. We have to use uh, the coherent derivative applied to the first term uh, times the second term plus the first term times the coherent derivative applied to the second term and minus the same thing for the second term we do here. And once again, uh, we can use the definition of the covariant derivative on the vector fields on this and this, with which will, this will give rise once again to Christoffel symbols. And then we are immediately we have immediately arrived to the formula, which is usually given in GR books. Oh God, yes. So yeah, here you can actually just because these are functions, you can pull them out. You can pull this out, pull this out. And you use the notion of the dual basis of dxl acting on del by del xp and so on for each of these terms. And you're left with the result of the Riemann tensor, which is always given in the GR books and which is hard to memorize usually. It's not easy to memorize this thing. <laughs> However, it's a straightforward yeah, computation course, yeah. if you the know this. The expressions for the curvature tensors are always weird. Uh, yeah, these are actually super hard to to uh, to memorize, but you can derive it in like four or five minutes if you know uh, if you yeah, know this. Method, method, it's really easy to arrive at it. Yeah, yeah, and this yeah. is what usually not uh, being done in books. This is given as uh, as an I don't know exercise to the reader, and it's very nice. Too. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> okay. Exactly. Yeah. Still got here we are also shows. Yes, please. Yeah, yeah. I just saw that you still got like three more slides. I was curious what's on them. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I just wanted to show that actually uh, in GR, you know, we always work without torsion, and I really wanted to show that uh, what torsion implies, like torsion freeness, implies that uh, the connection coefficients must be symmetric. That's what they. What that's what torsion free implies. Now I showed you actually. So you can go to this calculation as well if you guys are interested. Uh, yes, so please. here is the torsion. Yes. Yeah, yeah. Go for it. So here's the torsion defined in equation 37. It's very similar to the Riemann tensor, but we can see a crucial difference is that here it's not how it's not double covariant derivatives, rather just one. And if we do not have torsion, then it immediately follows that the left hand side is zero, and we can express the commutator. Uh, from the right hand side. So this is zero. We plug this here and then we got the expression we have here, right? Yes. Okay. Um, then, um, and I'm sorry, uh, there's a little mistake. I, I should, you, someone should correct me. Can someone tell me what's the mistake in this equation? I did eat this omega, I'm sorry. Oh. <laughs> but, but if you do not, I mean, it's not necessarily a mistake because uh, you can actually just uh, just simplify with all of omega, right? So the neat way to do it would be to omega acting on this is actually omega acting on this. But then you can simplify the omega because omega is not zero. Yeah, because omega is arbitrary. So this equality still holds. Right. Right. Exactly. 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 But I just did not write it down. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. But now we can see that uh, the torsion uh, uh, tensors uh, coefficients are given by you plug in a basis. We plug in the here the coordinate induced basis, and then it just takes this form. We did nothing else; just plug the plugged in the basis. And now uh, we can once again use the Christoffel symbol here, Christoffel symbols here, because this is exactly the same uh, computation which we had here, for instance. And then the Schwartz rule is important because the Schwartz rule just says that this commutator, like before, vanishes because uh, partial derivatives do commute. And then we have for the components of Ti, A, B, we have uh, dxi times uh, what we have left here coming from the expansion. So once again, I will repeat here, if we expand, we know that this is a vector field and every vector field can be expanded in a basis. And the expansion coefficients are just the Christoffel symbols. 
uh, because the vector co-vector fields are C infinity multilinear, it means that you can pull out the functions and then you can use the notion of the dual basis. And you will arrive here if you pull them out. You have this. And now you use the notion of the dual basis and you will e immediately get that the torsion is basically the anti-symmetric part of the Christoffel symbols. And uh, if you recall that uh, you want uh, your uh, torsion to be zero, then you, the left-hand side is zero and you get that gamma I B A equals gamma I A B, which is exactly the symmetry of the Christoffel symbols. And that's why we always have symmetric Christoffel symbols in general relativity. It comes from the very deep reason that we do torsion-free general relativity, right? And then, of course, we can write as the, the Christoffel symbols can be written as the symmetric part and the anti-symmetric part. And from this equation, if the torsion is zero, we can see that the anti-symmetric part vanishes. Therefore, they're immediately symmetric. But in the more general case, if one wants to do GR with torsion, for instance, if you check out Dirac's book on general relativity or Schrodinger's book on general relativity, they sometimes also discuss torsion. And that's it. That would be uh, all of my slides. I have like one question real quick that I just thought up of. Sure. So general relativity, the, dyna uh, the dynamical field of interest is a metric. In this case, yeah. your dynamical field is like the time component of the Christoffel symbol. I'm I'm wondering if there's like a way to cast it so the dynamical field is a metric. Like, is like a metric variable out of curiosity? Wait, okay. You're asking Newtonian gravity, right? Yeah. You're asking yeah. Newtonian, yeah. For like, for like this so, Newton, Newton Cartan theory, yeah. there's like so a way to cast it. To actually answer this question, we need a lot of technical details. But what I want to say right now is that uh, you do not even need a space-time metric for Newtonian space-time to make sense. That's going to be the topic of my next talk. So what you really yeah, need, I mean, you, you can you see that you way. will see. I will I will explicitly prove that the fact that we can choose inertial uh, frames of reference in Newtonian gravity, it will immediately imply that we have a spatial metric. It will immediately apply it. So uh, it's, it's a very interesting calculation, and it's also a bit technical. But you will see my my claim here is that you do not need you do not need a uh, metric uh, the dynamics of the metric in order to be able to talk about Newtonian gravity in a meaningful yeah, sense. You don't need the dynamics of the metric in order to be able to talk about it. That's just yes. curious. The only but thing also you need is this this fi this well the yeah. yeah. But also, you said you would like show like from from like the inertial frames and you um, the Newtonian framework that you don't need the metric. Yes. Doesn't yes, it curvature be. itself uh, imp uh, doesn't curvature itself obstruct the existence of like a global inertial frame in the first place? It, it, that's 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 a nice thing. That's a nice thing. So you can define inertial observers in a. I, I, inertial observers will be defined in a, let's say, rigorous way, which will allow you to define inertial observers. <laughs> That's the trick here. You're totally right that if you would actually have gravity, uh, if you would have any gravity, then you could not have a global inertial frame because that would mean that the manifold is flat. However, this is not going to be the case <laughs> because we're going to define inertial differently from, uh, from uh, what we've been used to. Okay, that makes sense. Cool. Yeah. But I'm going to do the very, very like uh, uh, axiomatic prescription and like uh, I'm going to define coordinate free all these equations and I'm uh, and we can also uh, we will also see why we don't really need a metric. But it's if you're interested, I, I suggest you the work of uh, Ehlers and Jürgen. Uh, sorry, Ehlers and who was it? Troutman. Troutman. Yeah. If you're interested, I will write down in seminar Troutman and Ehlers. Okay, Dravman and Aethers. Yeah, yeah. This, this, this. Uh, the work of these two, um, these two professors, uh, is uh, doing what I uh, said. However, these are pretty technical, and they, they usually you can find them only in form of papers. You cannot really find them in the form of textbooks. Okay, cool. I'll take a look at it. Thank you. Yeah, Definitely an interesting welcome. topic. You're welcome.
Does anyone else have questions related any related to anything I've said? And by the way, if um, you guys are interested in something related to general relativity or even quantum field theory, um, however, quantum field theory uh, from a way, way more uh, physicist perspective than this talk, uh, just say names of topics which you would be interested in, and I would I could probably do seminars uh, on those as well. But in quantum field theory, uh, I'm not even close to being on this mathematical level. Uh, so I would Actually, rather give I, physics. I was going to ask maybe. whether you whether you've done any uh, GR with spinners at all. Uh, yes, I have done GR with spinners, but not in class. So yes, well. It doesn't Actually, need to be in class. Uh, I mean, ju just any sort of familiarity. <laughs> yes, yes, yes. Uh, it's discussed very nicely in the Robert Wald's Wald's book. So that's uh, that, that, that's the one I use mostly. Yeah, but I am familiar with them. Yeah, this is they're very nice. And by the way, related to spinners, I'm taking this this semester. I'm taking a course from Mark Hamilton himself on mathematical gauge theory. So then we're going to discuss spinners in very detail. <laughs> As in very the, nice. the Skywalker dude. Yes, yes, yes. <laughs> he's a he's a physicist. He's a mathematical physicist. Oh, I had no yeah. idea. That is interesting. Uh, sorry, do you mind dropping just in the in the channel the name of the of the book you just referenced? Uh, of course. Thank you. This this one discusses spinners very nicely, and also if you're interested in stuff like singularity theorems, or if you're interested in stuff like uh, black holes in curved space time and stuff like that, it, it discusses this. Awesome. I, I really recommend the book. It's very nice. And then you said you said also that that um, Dirac discusses them as well. Yes, yes. If I remember, no one. Um, I'm not sure if he discusses spinners, but what he for sure discusses is GR with torsion. So what happens if you uh, if you impose torsion? Uh, uh, yes, 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 for, yes, yes. That's correct. Yeah. Yes. Um, yeah, because yeah, GI is always done torsion free, and I've never seen like with torsion. So okay, so okay, I'll check out Dirac for that one. Thanks. Yes, that uh, that can be done. However, the important thing is that, uh, <laughs> of course, from a mathematical physics or a mathematics point of view, this can be discussed. But what the physicist or theoretical physicist always wants or would like to is testable experiments. So from what I know so far, uh, GR with torsion does not have any testable experiments uh, uh, which would which would actually show that you know, there, there would be any reason to include torsion to the theory. But okay. uh, from but of course you can find uh, you can find the description of that, but I'm not really sure that from a physical point of view it would give you any significant uh, significant um, contribution. However, the spinner spinner talk is uh, is definitely I mean the spinner uh, thing is definitely important and definitely widely used not only in GR but also in many other fields of physics and that might be very nice to watch because it also gives physical content. I'm not very well versed in like QFT on like a curved background, but doesn't adding um doesn't adding spinners into your theory naturally introduce torsion into the um into into the connection, at least in like the Palatini formulation? Um what? That's a good question. I'm not sure, but I don't think that this is the case because you can do uh uh, GR with spinners without having any torsion from as, as far as I know like for instance walking with spinners is uh, Nothing special you just uh, choose the spin connection instead of the covariant derivative and you can show that uh, the two are uh, The two in specific uh, if you do a quarter transformation from the spinner basis into the the canonical basis which you always use you can show that uh, the covariant derivative applied to something would be the same but I'm not sure. Um, I would say that you can do spinners without torsion. However, if you're going to quantum or if you go to anything else, I'm not. I, I'm not sure about that. So I don't know. Okay. 
Actually, I just realized um, if, if you're more interested in that, uh, Ade himself worked with that. So if you want to like DM him or ping him, that would also work. Yeah. But I will be able to answer your question, something decent in uh, in like maybe three months. I'm taking a QFC on Curve Space Time lecture this, this term. Uh, the first lecture is going to be next week. So yeah. I'll probably be able to answer the question in like three months if you if you don't get an answer until then. But yeah, we will we will make make you wish you never said that. <laughs> yeah, uh, I mean uh, the reason I said that is because like I would, I I know what like mother predictions talking about like yeah you can reformulate your because like when you're talking about spinners your dynamical fields now become your spin connection and your tetrad right. Yes, and that's right. But if you now now you now to you incorporate the tetrad, you can put it into the metric. And I thought that if you get the equations of motion from that, you naturally get uh, torsion in your theory. But I I I, I don't know. If I'm, I'm not very well versed in that. So I'm not sure either. But my point, or maybe the point I'm trying to make, of course, without all the mathematical details, is that when you choose the spin or the tetrad, it's, it's basically what you do is you just choose a different basis on your tangent spaces, right? You could choose any basis you like, and it should not affect the physics. So, okay. but yeah, I'm not 100% sure about that. So I, I will check it out for sure. Yeah. 